It's well known that the original Xbox is very similar to a PC under the hood, something that really sets it apart from its contemporaries which pretty much all use custom silicon. I mean you can't exactly build a PS2 or GameCube PC out of off the shelf components. So what would happen if you built a PC around the Xbox's specifications using equivalent parts? Despite the software differences, would it be able to match up with the real thing in gaming performance? Well in this video we're going to have a bit of a deep delve into this idea and seeing if we can build an original Xbox PC. First things first, let's have a little refresher on the original Xbox specs so we know what we need to build our system around. Starting with the CPU, it has an Intel Pentium 3 copper mine clocked at 733 MHz. Now, there's some debate as to whether it's more like a Celeron as it has 128K of cache instead of a desktop Pentium 3's 256K, but this is still 8-way associative cache rather than the 4-way associative cache of a Celeron, so I'd say it's closer to a true Pentium 3. For graphics, it's using Nvidia's NV2A GPU, which is like a weird hybrid of a GeForce 3 and GeForce 4. In short, it has the hardware configuration of the latter GPU, but the general feature set of the former. I'll go into detail on this in a bit, but for now just keep this in mind as we get into the build proper. Now RAM wise we have 64MB of DDR RAM, which is shared with both the CPU and GPU. This is actually one big limitation of the console, and it's common to upgrade this to 128MB in order for some more complex homebrew to work. For software it's using a heavily modified version of Windows 2000 with all games on the system using Microsoft's own DirectX API, hence the nickname DirectXbox. In the end, it's quite different from a full copy of Windows 2000, and has a lot of the bloat trimmed making for an extremely optimized OS for games. This is one edge the Xbox will always have over a PC, as there's nothing quite like this OS off the shelf. With those specs in mind, we need to put together a system. So let's have a look at all the parts and get this thing assembled. First up is the motherboard. For this I chose the OEM Compact D815E, a fairly entry level Socket 370 motherboard that gets a lot right for the price. It features an Intel i 752 iGPU as well as onboard audio and Ethernet, which made it a great choice for this build as preferably I didn't want to track down a separate sound and network card. It's by no means a high-end board, but again was a great fit for this project thanks to its feature richness and being very easy to come across, but it has one Achilles heel which we'll talk about a little later. Next is the heart of the system, and I used a Coppermine Pentium 3 clocked at 1GHz. Now originally I planned to use a 733MHz P3 same as the original Xbox, but trying one I noticed a massive CPU bottleneck and performance well below our target. I'd have to attribute this to all the extra fluff and background applications in a full fat copy of Windows, and it's likely chewing away at precious CPU clock cycles, so this change was to accommodate for that loss in performance. Even then, it's pretty much identical to the Xbox's CPU barring clock speed and cache size differences. The GPU is next, and here I opted to use the Nvidia GeForce 4 Ti4200. Now some of you might be asking, why did I use a GeForce 4 instead of a GeForce 3? Most sources list the original Xbox's GPU as being GeForce 3 based. And while this is partly true, there is one critical thing missing from all NV20 GPUs that NV2A does have, a second vertex shader. As a result, all of the GeForce 3 cards have drastically lower vertex output than the Xbox's GPU, meaning that the closest you'll be able to get is with an NV25 GeForce 4 card, where Nvidia added this second vertex shader. So, the Xbox GPU is a GeForce 4, that settles it, right? Well, not really. It's not entirely the same as there's some extra features Nvidia added to NV25 that were not present in the Xbox's GPU, and they include a revised AA engine in the second iteration of their Lightspeed Memory Architecture, or LMA, which brings around a 25% improvement in Z-occlusion culling, making GeForce 4 much more efficient at discarding unseen pixels. Since the original Xbox's GPU doesn't have these improvements that would come in GeForce 4, it's often compared to a GeForce 3 GPU. But I'm more than willing to deal with these differences in the feature set, as in my opinion, it's much better than having to contend with half the vertex output. The TI4200 was specifically chosen here, as it's the closest in clock speed to the Xbox's GPU and the easiest to find in the stack, although keep in mind all of the higher end GeForce 4 cards can be down clocked to match. This card is the 128MB version, which definitely helps out with higher resolutions as seen in my previous videos of this card. For today's testing though, most of it is not going to be used. Before we get into too much technical mumbo jumbo, let's take a look at the memory, and I use a 256MB kit of SDR RAM by Samsung. It runs at 133MHz and has a cast latency of 3, it's not the best stuff but it was great for the system. Now you might be thinking this is a bit unfair as the original Xbox had just 64MB of RAM, but as I mentioned before we don't have the benefit of running an extremely stripped down OS specifically optimized for 3D applications, and all of the background tasks in a full copy of Windows will quickly eat up that RAM, so this was a very much needed change. The case is an old Asia Pro Asus from 2005, its build quality is pretty substandard, but I picked it because it's what I have on hand and also has a nice X in the side panel window cause, you know, Xbox? Anyway, moving on to the PSU, it was kind of a long story. 
Now, upon receiving the motherboard, I found out that despite using a standard 24 pin connector, it's not wired the same. As such, any regular PSU won't work with the system, and a special proprietary one is required. I'm not 100% sure on which models will do the trick, but for my case, the compact model 161071-001 worked. This is definitely a huge disadvantage for this board, and if I were to improve this in the future, I would definitely use something else, as having to source 20-year-old power supplies that could kick the bucket at any moment is just... not great. To add on to this, the PSU screw holes don't line up with the standard ATX power supply, so I could only screw it in on two sides. Ugh, so frustrating to deal with proprietary OEM BS. For storage, I used a PNY CS900 240GB SSD with a Kingwin IDE to SATA adapter. It's completely overkill for a system like this, but it's what I had on hand and should be very responsive to use and give us ideal load time in these games. Okay, so now that we've had a look at all the parts, it's time to build this system. The build was a success. The PC boots and all we have left to do is install some software. The OS is a bit of a complicated subject when it comes to a system like this. As I mentioned, there's nothing quite like the original Xbox's custom OS for PC. I had originally planned to use Windows 2000, but I had a fair amount of issues getting some of my games to work, even with kernel extensions, so I scrapped that idea and used good old Windows XP 32-bit. And if you're worried that we're leaving some performance on the table, the games that did work on 2000 had identical results on XP, so we should still be seeing the correct performance. Now considering we're testing an Xbox equivalent PC, we're gonna need some Xbox games, so here I selected 8 of them. They cover a fairly wide range of the original Xbox's library, from launch titles all the way to games made at the tail end of the Xbox's lifespan in late 2005. When selecting game settings, I tried my best to match visuals on the Xbox ports. It's not completely apples to apples, but should be very close. Resolution-wise, I went for the same game resolution as on the Xbox, which in most cases was 480p, but there is a couple games where we used a different mode. And one more thing, I used an external capture device to capture footage from both the PC and my actual original Xbox to compare FPS and visuals on a superficial level. I would have used something like Teardrop for a more direct comparison, but I had a lot of trouble getting accurate results from my crappy capture card. Alright, we have a lot to get through, so without any further ado, let's now dig into some testing. First game up is Halo Combat Evolved. Here I used the high settings at 480p and benched using a 60 second run of the first level to get our numbers. Now looking at the results, we averaged a fitting 30 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 14. Looking at the frame times, there is some inconsistencies across the board, but it's nothing that made the game unpleasant. On the Xbox, the frame rate is a bit more stable, but it's still a good showing for the system and nicely in line with our target of 30 FPS. Next, let's look at Half-Life 2. Now, this game was definitely a system killer for the original Xbox considering its hardware constraints. I tested a 75 second run of the Water Hazard chapter as it's consistent and demanding. Here we averaged 25 frames per second with 1% lows down to 10. Frame times were fairly good in the former half of the benchmark, but it definitely started to lose some steam towards the end. In addition, there were some issues here and there with hard stops. It didn't take me out of the game too much, but definitely makes for some dismal 0.1% lows. While this game targets 30fps on the original Xbox, on there it also has a lot of performance issues, with frame rates sometimes dipping well into the single digits, so I guess our results are still on point here. Given the age of the hardware though, it's an impressive feat to see Half-Life 2 being playable, Xbox or PC. Moving on to Star Wars Battlefront 2, I went for the low preset at 800x600 as oddly enough I couldn't get the game to work in 480p even after editing some config files. Anyhow, I benched a 3 minute segment of an instant action match on Croissant, and here we managed 27 frames per second on average, with 1% lows down to 17. Frame times were decent, with some micro stutter throughout the whole run, but despite this the game was very enjoyable and was almost exactly matching the Xbox for average frame rate, impressive to see it holding out despite the increase in resolution. Fable of the Lost Chapters is the next game up, and we tested a 480p with a mix of low and medium settings and a 60 second run of Oakvale. We averaged 22 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 10. 
Checking out the frame time graphs, things look pretty good overall, with the exception of one large swing around the middle of the run. All in all, it's a decent result. Now, this was another demanding game that struggled quite a bit on the Xbox, as on there it would often see dips into the 20s with a lot going on, so as far as averages, we're definitely close, but again, the PC is coming up short in the lows. Next came up is the Elder Scrolls Morrowind, and here I used 40p with the default settings. I tested a quick run through Sata Neen and we averaged 17 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 10. Frame times were alright, but there were some harsh swings in the run which again can be seen in the 0.1% lows. I think this is just one of those games that runs a lot better on the original Xbox, as on there it hovers well above the 20s most of the time. This game is pretty demanding, but I wasn't expecting the PC to fall behind by this much. Very interesting to see. Serious Sam 2 is up and I used the low preset at 480p along with a built-in Branchester demo for consistent results. The PC averaged 26 frames per second with 1% lows down to 17. Surprisingly frame times were actually pretty good with very little in the way of stutter. Compared to the Xbox they're very closely matched as while the Xbox does a better job sticking to 30fps it can have some performance tips as well. Second to last game is Need for Speed Most Wanted, and using 480p with a mix of low and medium settings in the first race against Razer, we averaged 30 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 14. Frame times look pretty rough across the board, with dips all over the place and occasional hard stops. Overall, while the average frame rates are where we want them to be, frame times were falling well behind, as this game is actually pretty stable on the Xbox. And the last game for today is Freedom Fighters. Now this is actually capable of running in HD on the Xbox, so here I use 720p with a medium settings and benched a 60 second segment of the first level. The PC put down 43 frames per second on average, with 1% lows down to 19. There was a little bit of micro stutter during the run as seen in the frame time graphs, but I'm pleased to say it remained way more than playable. On the Xbox, the game targets 30fps and it stays there. Given these results, I'd say the port could have benefited from an uncapped frame rate as a lot of the time we are well above 30fps. Although this title is seldom talked about when it comes to showcasing the Xbox's power, I think it's a great example of what it can do with HD resolutions when given a great and well-optimized game. As always, we'll include some power draw results as well, and for this I used a static scene from Half-Life 2 and took a measurement of the entire system power consumption. Just keep in mind these are numbers straight from the wall and as such they do not factor in PSU efficiency. My original Xbox sips 51 watts of power, while the PC consumes 67% more power at 85 watts, which is a pretty huge jump. There's a lot of things to keep in mind here, like my Xbox being a version 1.6, it having a newer hard drive, the game not running from discs, so your mileage will definitely vary from Xbox to Xbox. Not only that, the increased voltage and clock speeds of our CPU is playing a part here, so this kind of increase starts to make sense, all things considered. Even then, both systems are very light on power. I mean, compared to most of the stuff I test, this is really low and refreshing to see. So there you have it, the original Xbox equivalent PC. While there was definitely some more tweaks I could have made to the hardware configuration like a proper motherboard and some faster RAM, I still think this is an extremely close PC adaptation of the original Xbox. But the real question is, does it hold a candle to the real deal? As always with a video like this, it's not really a straight yes or no conclusion, it's a lot more nuanced than just that. I will say it's great to see our system getting very close to or matching the original Xbox for average frame rates in this roundup, but it left a lot to be desired in the frame times department. Of course, the Xbox is always going to have some inherent advantages even if we have some similar hardware. For instance, it definitely helps to have an extremely slimmed down OS as well as games being optimized for a specific hardware configuration, so I felt those significant changes to the CPU and RAM amount were very much warranted. While I don't think the system is the ultimate original Xbox PC or anything, it sure as hell is close, and I'm more than satisfied with that. On the whole, this video was a ton of fun to make, and actually my first rodeo with the Pentium 3 system as well, which is kind of why this video took so long. A lot of my time was spent troubleshooting, but it was well worth it for this interesting build. Growing up, I was always intrigued by the Xbox's similarity to a PC, and it's amazing to finally have that system I've been dreaming about for so long. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this dive into building a PC around one of my favorite consoles. I thought it'd be a fitting end to my trilogy of original Xbox videos. 
If I really build the ultimate Xbox PC, maybe I'll make a follow-up, but for now it's time to move on to some other projects. Thanks for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you all in the next one.